Brochim Habayim, welcome to all of you for being here today for our workshop on Alzheimer's and dementia and helping families. Uh, all of you, during the last year or so, were interviewed by the um, commission that has been established to deal with this issue in the Jewish community. And throughout those interviews, all of you said the one thing you wanted was to learn more. You wanted to, uh, to become more of an expert on this important topic because it comes up so often. Well, today we have that opportunity. When we became rabbis, each and every one of us, I suspect, it was Torah and text study uh, that was an important motivation and reason for entering the rabbinate. Working in the real world, as all of us do, uh, we become aware of the other roles that occupy our attention and that they have become important means through which to impart Torah and to live by it ourselves. All of us encounter in our congregations and rabbinic positions people with challenges. They often look to us and to the synagogue to be a sanctuary, a place to find help, support, understanding, and an anchor when they feel awash and ungrounded. In the past, there have been other such issues that were long ignored, overlooked, avoided because of a variety of reasons. But the Twin Cities has always been a place where we've been blessed with many resources to help us face such issues and help those who depend on us. We rabbis have had all-day workshops on alcoholism in the Jewish community, suicide, and domestic abuse just to name a few. Today the issue is dementia and Alzheimer's. We all notice it and that prompts us to get help ourselves so that we can be helpful and supportive to those people who come to us. And if we don't see it as a problem, then we really are missing something today. We are blessed in the Twin Cities to have two great agencies that provide deep resources. Jewish Family Service in St. Paul, and Jewish Family and Children's Services here in Minneapolis. But often, we rabbis are the first contact, formally and informally. In conversations we have with our congregants, we learn about the challenges that families and individuals are facing. Other times, unprompted, we notice behaviors. We all see people who are stricken and their family who are just as much in need of our attention and our help. We don't know what to do so often, but we are here today not to become highly trained specialists. We are rabbis, 
but all of us today can gain some tools and some tips. We can learn about the deeper resources in our community. Maybe we can each create programs in our congregations and institutions, such as what we did here at Bet Shalom not too long ago over the high holidays, where we had an overwhelming turnout in the middle of Yom Kippur for our um, Food for Thought Forum, and people came away hungry for more. We all can learn what signs to look for. What are the basic do's and don'ts? Thou shalts and thou shalt nots. How can we support the caregivers, the family, in each generation? We rabbis like to see ourselves as gatekeepers in marriage, conversion, and kashrut. Jewish standards are the core of our business. One of our goals today, among many, is to apply the standards of kedushah, of holiness, in this area of sacred aging. Brochim Habaim, welcome to our program. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain, where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination, and in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady, and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.org. A person with Alzheimer's disease lives on average between eight to 10 years uh, since they're being diagnosed. But there's a wide range People may live between two to 20 years. Uh, people progress from early stage to mid stage to late stage of the disease uh, in different rates. So some people may be in a plateau for several years. And others, thank you, um, 
and others may um, and others may be uh, may decline rapidly. Um, half of persons with Alzheimer's disease are never diagnosed in this country. One quarter of those who live alone who live at home um, are live alone. So we need to pay special attention to this uh, group. So what is dementia? Um, dementia is an umbrella term of different uh, diseases and conditions. Uh, and the most prevalent one is Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for between 60 to 80% of the different forms of dementia. Today, uh, we're gonna talk mostly about Alzheimer's disease. In the packets that you're gonna receive, you have a handout that describes some of the other forms of <coughs> dementia. One of the things we need to know uh, is to avoid generalizations. So when we see or talk about one person with Alzheimer's, we see and talk about one person with Alzheimer's. Um, so no two people with the disease are impacted in the same way. The frequency and the severity of the symptoms uh, vary from a person to person. Uh, certain symptoms occur uh, only in certain stages of the disease and not in others. Not every person uh, experiences all the symptoms that I'm gonna describe shortly. Now the difficulties may fluctuate between uh, in, this, in the same person uh, within the same day or hour. Uh, as a wife said about her husband, his abilities fluctuate day to day, maddeningly inconsistent. You'll also receive a handout called What's the Difference? It describes some of the differences between normal age-related uh, changes versus changes in Alzheimer's disease. But in general, in Alzheimer's, the symptoms are severe enough to interrupt uh, with the person uh, independent function. For example, memory loss uh, that is ser seriously interferes with the person's ability to function at work or in social gatherings. Physical appearance may, de may be deceptive. The person may look like us and walk fine well into the later stage of the disease, but this is misleading especially with common efforts to hide, compensate, and with, when there's limited awareness of deficits. As Richard Taylor said, when you look at me, you only see my outside persona. You cannot see my symptoms, my progress, my fears, and my constant battle with forgetting and misunderstanding. Gradually, as the disease progresses, the person has more difficulty in the following cognitive functions. And I need to emphasize that these are common symptoms in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease. And um, one set of symptoms that is always present in this disease is impaired, uh, impairment of recent memory, or what we call uh, short-term memory. Uh, and by that, I'm, by that we mean difficulty remembering new information from past hour, or day, or week. Uh, a person with Alzheimer's said, <coughs> I cannot tell you what is the weather report after listening to it. Another person said, I read a chapter, then tomorrow I read the second, but can't remember the first. <coughs> so forgetting recent conversations and events, even after being reminded. Repeating oneself minutes apart, misplacing and losing personal belongings, um, and many times a day. Um, and then we have six domains uh, that are listed here in the slide. And I, I need to say that uh, only, uh, it, it could be with, with every single person, he, can, he or she can experience one or more of these sets of symptoms, uh, and sometimes. So we need to remember that. The first domain is difficulty with reasoning uh, or the ability to think logically. Difficulty planning and solving problems uh, uh, for example, uh, with tasks that involve serious steps, such as things we take for granted as paying bills, uh, cooking a meal, driving a car, or um, using household appliances. The second domain is disorientation in time and place. Uh, difficulties with directions uh, and reaching desired destinations and getting lost, outdoors and indoors. So if I may ask a person with Alzheimer's in the mid stages say, to go from here, from Jacob's room, where we are now, to the sanctuary, and the person was a, a member of the congregation for 40 years, the person may still not be able to locate the room, or it would take him a lot of time, with a lot of frustration. 
<clears throat> the third domain is difficulty with language, uh, trouble finding the right word and remembering names, uh, slow, slower process of information in general, and also diminished vo vocabulary, ability to articulate thoughts and understand others' speech. The fourth domain is poor concentration and short attention span. Here we talk about difficulty following a, a conversation, especially group conversation. <clears throat> and reading with little or no comprehension. The fifth domain is difficulty with spatial relations and perception. <clears throat> For example, changes in depth perception. We, want, uh, we once took a group of residents with Alzheimer's to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And one woman, I was standing next to her, and she was uh, standing by 100 stairs, beautiful stairs, uh, standing right there. And then she uh, almost tripped and fell, fell down because she said, I couldn't differentiate between the stairs. Mm -hmm. They're not marked. So we need to think Alzheimer friendly uh, when, we, when we plan uh, public uh, spaces. Um, judging distances, uh, one person hit a, a, a parked car in a wide open road. And other difficulties uh, with recognizing familiar people or objects or distinguishing an object from its background. Um, people may experience distorted images. Uh, some people in the later stages may, ex may see a large de de uh, decorative uh, carpet and it may confuse them and it may confuse them and even scare them. The sixth domain is decreased or poor judgment. Here we're talking about difficulty <coughs> making decisions, sound decisions. One, uh, one person gave her entire life savings to a dishonest neighbor. Another person turned on the thermostat to 85 uh, degrees um, at home, and she uh, almost uh, killed, was killed uh, by the intense heat. And then there's uh, other non-cognitive or behavioral changes, which I, I'm not going to co cover all of them. Uh, I'm going to cover just a couple, a couple of the first one. Changes in mood and personality. Uh, but I should say that personality changes are seldom uh, uh, dramatic in the early stages. Uh, that being said, the person may not seem like their old self. Uh, many uh, develop uh, depression. Uh, there's lack of initiative is, is, is common. Lack of interest in previous activities or people uh, previously enjoyed, the person previously enjoyed. And then there's uh, serious sleeping problems. And you can ask care, family care, care partners uh, how sleep deprived they are because uh, the person is unable to sleep for different uh, reasons. And then there's delusional thinking, which is rare in the early stages. Uh, here we talk about beliefs that are, that are not true in our, our reality. There's changes in sexuality. Um, there's a diminished coordination, such as difficulty with fine motor functions or eye-hand coordination. We can talk about the losses forever. And the losses need to be recognized and grieved. But what we really need to focus on is on the persisting assets, on the remaining abilities. Uh, this picture uh, was taken by Dr. Uh, Kathy Greenbelt, who is the author of the book, uh, Love, Loss, and Laughter. It's a wonderful book that shifts uh, attitudes about people with Alzheimer's with hundreds of, of pictures from around the world, um, showing that there are positive aspects, uh, there can be positive experiences with the disease. Uh, so I thank uh, Kathy for uh, generously allowing me to use the pictures uh, in the presentation today. This is a wood-carved model of a right hemisphere uh, of, of the brain. And um, the reason why I'm showing it to you is because um, there is one part of the brain. <coughs> I'm going to point right here. There's a dark green uh, small area. Um, and the most important thing we need to uh, remember when we interact, <coughs> communicate, or care for person with Alzheimer's is that the part of the brain uh, that controls emotions remains relatively intact into the later stages of the disease. We also saw it in the yellow brain animation of David Schenck earlier on. And this is the, uh, the medium uh, through which we can really connect with these individuals. As author Jean Lee uh, says, just because I'm having trouble expressing myself does not mean I don't, have, I don't still have exactly the same feelings and emotions. When I'm talking about preserved emotional capacity, what does it mean? Um, 
So people with Alzheimer's are able to experience the full range of emotions that you and I uh, feel w uh, into their later stages of the disease. Uh, they're able to perceive emotions in others. As one manager said, they're feeling our core emotions. They're able to communicate emotionally uh, through facial expressions, gestures, and tone of voice. Um, and the, and research, re, uh, a recent uh, research by Professor Strum showed an increased sensitivity to the emotional states of those around the person. The capacity to remember emotionally significant events, especially early, well-established, uh, personally meaningful memories, is preserved into later stages of the disease. And this is very important when we provide care to these individuals or whoever interacts with them on a regular basis the ability to sense who has real concern for them, who is honest, and who can be trusted. Other relatively preserved capacities, the remote memory, or what we call the long-term memory, uh, memories from childhood and young adulthood are preserved into later stages in many people with Alzheimer's. The basic principle is what goes in <coughs> first, what goes in first goes out last. And what I mean by that is that the losses, the losses of abilities occur in the reverse order of their original development, or abilities or functions acquired earlier in life are lost last in Alzheimer's. And this is where we want to focus when we try to engage those individual, individuals in, in something meaningful. Um, another type of memory that is preserved into the later stage of the disease is called procedural memory, or lifelong overland habitual skills. Just to give an example, a woman who played the organ for 50 years uh, is still able to play it, yes, with encouragement and cueing, well into her mid-stages of Alzheimer's disease. Same goes for vi uh, people who play the violin and other instruments. It's remarkable to see that. Primary motor functions, walking, uh, is preserved into later stages of the disease. M and also dancing. There's many people who are unable to speak a word or unable to speak coherently, but boy, they can dance. Uh, primary sensory functions, gentle touch, massage, soothing aromas, including essential oils, and the grapefruit scent that is now diffused in the room. I hope you sense it. Um, the ability to reach out to someone in need. Some of the most compassionate acts occur between people with dementia. I've seen uh, incredible acts of compassion between residents with dementia, those in the earlier stages assisting those in the later stages. And we can, we can all learn from that. Aesthetic appreciation, in simply enjoying a beautiful artwork. There's programs now uh, in museums that are uh, developed specifically for people with Alzheimer's uh, and, and they're really wonderful and effective in bringing positive emotions in these individuals or simply looking at a beautiful garden, uh, a garden, excuse me, or a forest, or a lake, or an ocean. And musical abilities. Uh, you have more information about musical abilities in the handout called Remaining Abilities. But let me just say that these abilities, the musical abilities, are preserved well into the advanced stages of Alzheimer's. This is one of the most effective ways we have to connect, meaningfully engage, and bring joy to these individuals. So for instance, the ability to uh, keep a, a steady uh, drum beat, as we saw this lady from Japan, I believe, um, uh, remains intact. Um, so uh, there's a lot of percussion groups in nursing homes that are really successful. Sense of humor and the ability to smile and laugh uh, is preserved into later stages of the disease. The ability to be present in the moment not a few minutes ago, not 10 minutes from now, but in this very second. And that's a crucial principle for today's, uh, today's talk. Um, and another thing that we should know is that the lifelong social masks, the masks that we all wear throughout our lives tend to fall and people are very genuine with you for good and sometimes for less so. So we have a choice. We can continue and focus on the losses, or we can uh, choose to focus on what remains. This can make all the difference in terms of the quality of life of these individuals. 
What you see in the picture um, is um, a laughter yoga session. And I think it speaks for itself. So this section is practical approaches with persons with Alzheimer's, and then we're going to transition into communication techniques. So I'm going to throw a lot of ideas and strategies and things you may want to consider. Just try to hold on to uh, onto the key points that resonate with you, and you'll do great when you interact with these individuals. Um, so what are the primary goals of caring for individuals with Alzheimer's disease? The first goal is that we want to preserve their personhood, identity, <clears throat> and um, personhood, identity, and uh, dignity. The second is to bring positive emotional states uh, in, uh, during the day, evening, and night. People think Alzheimer's disease ends at 9 p.m., uh, but you should do some observations at night and see what, what, what takes place. The third goal is to proactively meet the person's needs in the following domains of function. Physiological, functional, medical, psychological, social, occupational, environmental, spiritual, and religious needs. The fourth goal is that we want to ensure that the people are safe and free from psychological harm. And the last one is to assist the person to continue and have meaning and purpose in their lives. So what are the main psychological needs of a person with dementia? Uh, when you came, you, you received uh, on your seats, you received a handout, a purple handout um, with a flower-shaped diagram. Uh, and Professor Tom Kitwood from the UK identified six uh, main psychological needs. The need for comfort, attachment, inclusion, occupation, identity, and the central need to continue to love and to be loved. Unfortunately, these needs are often unmet, which, which compromises the people's uh, personhood and leads to tremendous suffering and distressing behaviors. I will address some of those needs during my talk. As to the needs of it for attachment, one of the most important things we need to know is that a close, trusting relationship is the single most important asset we have when we interact, communicate, and care for these individuals. It is hard work to build and maintain it, though. And as Gola, author of the book, Care That Works, a relationship approach, says, the person's trust is the single most important asset a caregiver has. It is, however, easily lost. Contrary to common belief, the need for close friendships and relationships actually increases in many with the disease. A common and heartbreaking phenomenon is that friends stay away from people when they hear that they have been diagnosed. When Richard Taylor asked his friends, why are you staying away from me? They said, we don't know what to say. We don't want to embarrass you by asking you things that you may not be able to answer. So Richard told them, why, do you, why don't you just say hello, for God's sakes? Mm -hmm. Just say hello. Anytime you meet someone with dementia, just say hello to them. If you'll ever wonder how, to be, how best to approach a situation or even an ethical dilemma uh, with a person with Alzheimer's, you may want to ask yourself this question. What would I do if this person was my best friend? And in fact, there's a whole method and a book that is called the best friend approach in, in caring for people with Alzheimer's, uh, developed by Virginia, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, Virginia Bell. A word about the use of language. In the old culture of dementia care, we use terms such as Alzheimer's patients. In the new culture of dementia care, we use terms such as a person with Alzheimer's. Words have strong shaping power on the way we perceive and relate to these individuals. It is very important to put the person before the disease. In the words of a person with Alzheimer's, I have the disease, but I'm not the disease. I love, I hate, and I feel just like anyone else. As to the psychological need identity, and by that, Professor Kitwood uh, uh, means to know who one is in cognition and feeling to have a sense of continuity with one's past. The first thing you want to do is to learn as much as you can about the person's life's history. 
you receive a handout in the packet that is called Why Do We Need to Know the Early Life History of People with Alzheimer's that describes about 20 reasons. Uh, this will help you to strike a conversation with the person, engage them in a meaningful activity, understand the causes and triggers of distressing behaviors, and preserve their identity and personhood. So um, this incident took place in a, in a VA medical center, and it was published by Professor Johnston. Uh, so there's a group of residents, and they're transplanting uh, uh, blooming tulips. Um, and it's a beautiful day. Everything goes well. And suddenly, one of the residents becomes pale, agitated, hyperventilates, and he strikes another resident. So what do they do? They grab him, uh, tie him, uh, uh, restrain him, and take him to the, back to the lock unit. And then when he sat with the, with the stuff, he shared that um, he recalled becoming distressed on seeing the tulips, and he recounted an incident during combat decades ago uh, where several of his platoon uh, buddies were killed after having been con uh, cornered in a tulip field. Uh, so what we need to do is to instruct staff to avoid exposing him to this remote trigger. I'm going to say a couple of words about uh, behaviors. Behaviors are considered to be one of the most challenging aspects of the disease, becoming irritable, restless, anxious, fearful, agitated, aggressive, and being resistant to personal care. These behaviors mostly take place, the serious uh, ones, take place in more in the mid to late stage of the disease. What you need to know about behavioral expressions in Alzheimer's disease is that most behaviors are actually attempts by the person to communicate an unmet need. They're never random. There is an important reason behind the behavior. There's usually, uh, they usually have a meaning, purpose, and a function. There's an immediate or remote trigger most of the times before the behavior occur. And some of the major causes of those behaviors uh, include boredom, fatigue, frustration, being overwhelmed, or angry. Persons with Alzheimer's disease become distressed for the same reasons that we do. The difference is that they have less ability to tolerate or cope with the stress or verbally communicate it. As to the psychological need to be occupied, many have difficulty or inability to initiate uh, engagement in something in, uh, meaningful. So we need to help them engage in meaningful, enriching, appropriate, failure-free adult activities. Dr. Paul Rea from the Alzheimer's Association in Massachusetts, who is a national expert in prevention of behaviors in this population, says, Activities are the main weapon against behavioral difficulties and violent behaviors. Professor Camp says, if a person with dementia is engaged in a meaningful activity, the person cannot simultaneously experience behavior, behavioral expressions. And of course, if the activity is not planned well or not executed well, or there's an underlying medical condition, you may see distress and uh, behaviors. The reality, however, is that most people with Alzheimer's are not engaged in something meaningful during most of their days and evenings. Many led active and productive lives. They want to continue and be engaged with purpose and meaning after being diagnosed. They want to continue and stay active and feel useful. And when there's nothing meaningful to do, many become restless and anxious, develop behaviors, and the vicious cycle of psychotropic medications begins. So boredom can be the enemy of certain, boredom can be the enemy of certain people with Alzheimer's. That being said, people do need rest times, and others are perfectly fine sitting and just being for extended periods. So it's about finding that optimum balance between understimulation and overstimulation for each individual. Many memories of their early life, um, many have memories of their early lives, but need assistance ex accessing them. There's a treasure chamber waiting to be opened. Sometimes all you need to do is say, tell me about the life on the farm where you grew up. Again, long-term memory is preserved. Rita, could you please pass the family album around? My mother had dementia, and uh, we would visit her, and it would become difficult to communicate with her. And so as a family, we developed what was called a life story book, and told the story of my mom. 
um, the pictures from her past so that each time we visited, we would go through the book. And you know, with someone with dementia, they don't remember what she did the day before, so you can go through the book. As you can see, it's got go to the book over and over with her, and each time she would find that joy in going through it. And then when visitors came, they could pull the book out and sit with her and go through the pages, or staff can go through. So Rabbi said, you, as you visit people and talk to families, you could have families to put together such a book to make your visits even that easier to go through the books with, them, with your um, congregants. So I'm going to just pass it around a little bit. Kind of yeah. <laughs> I looked at it earlier before the program, and I think it's really precious the information that is inside uh, to be able to generate meaningful conversations about uh, fond memories from the past and family members. I've never seen residents in the mid to late stages of dementia so happy for so long as when they are visited by a group of toddlers. <laughs> Communication techniques or what Eileen Shami, author uh, Eileen Shami calls relationship building communication. Remember, it's all about the relationship. What helps and what doesn't help when communicating with a person with Alzheimer's? A daughter of a woman with Alzheimer's recently shared a story in one of the support groups um, uh, that took place recently. She said that she's the only one in her family that is able to communicate effectively and gain her mother's cooperation uh, uh, more than anybody else in the family. The interesting part of the story was that the daughter was deaf. So what this tells us is that it's less about the words that are exchanged, and it's more about the cues, uh, taking the cues from the nonverbal language. Most of the communication with Alzheimer's can be characterized as emotional language, which is conveyed through body language, facial expressions, gestures, and tone of voice. One of the great misperceptions is that it is not possible to communicate meaningfully uh, with persons with Alzheimer's. If we relearn how to communicate, put aside our deeply embedded habitual ways of communicating, and put on new lenses, Alzheimer's lenses, then it is possible, it is possible to meaningfully connect and communicate with most well into the disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, I am asking you to be open to a fundamentally a new way of thinking. If we want to be uh, effective in communicating with these people, we need to make the shift from our lifelong doing skills uh, to being skills, to being skills. Uh, I also ask that you try to let go of your reality, as it is essential to being able to connect with theirs. As a person with dementia said recently, you have to learn how to live in my world. I cannot live in your world anymore. So you want to create the conditions for a successful visit. And there's three keys. One is preparation. Second is preparation. And the third is preparation. <clears throat> Before you visit, learn everything you can about the person's life history and current abilities and disabilities. Make sure you have everything you need with you, whether it's a large print name tag or a, prayer, or a large print prayer book, prayer shawls, a CD with player with songs the person enjoyed when she or he were young or Jewish traditional objects and symbols that are meaningful to the person. So you won't have to live in the middle to get them. Find out ahead of time what's the best time to visit, when the person is rested and most alert, and when scheduled care or organized activities are not planned. This hopefully will help minimize interruptions. So you wanna, when you, before you approach the person, you want to avoid conversations in, in hectic and loud places. Noise really distracts uh, people with Alzheimer's. So try to eliminate noise from the source, whether it's TV or radio. When possible, when you walk into an area of a nursing home or a hospital um, where a person is located, first try to observe the person carefully from distance to identify all the nonverbal signals you can pick up. Take what Nomi File, the founder of validation method, calls the emotional temperature. Take the emotional temperature of the person to get a good sense of their state of being in that moment. This will assist you to make your initial approach. Whatever you do, you need to slow down. You should never act as if you are in a hurry or outpace the person. Why? Because they process information in a much slower pace than we do. Christine Bryden, author of the book, Who Will I Be When I Die, writes, I'm like a slow motion version of my old self, not physically, but mentally. 
Never approach a person with Alzheimer's from the, from the back, from behind, or from the side. Always from the front. So never approach them from behind. Many have a narrow field of vision. And if you approach them from the side, they may not see you. So one uh, resident in a dementia unit walked to uh, wash her hands in the sink in the dining room. While she was walking, her pants fell down. A nurse aide wanted to help her to pull up the pants. So she came behind her. And what happened? The resident almost struck her in the face in a reflexive uh, back elbow motion. Never approach a person, so, so uh, I'm sorry. Never pull or push a chair from, from behind a person without informing her or him or asking their permission first. It happens all the time. We're talking about preserving personhood. Make sure there is no source of light or glare behind you when you talk with the person. As people age, they are very sensitive to glare uh, and will not be able to see your face. Always speak at the level of the eyes of the person, uh, as you can see in the picture here. One person is sitting, one person is uh, kneeling down, even below the person. Uh, when we do that, we send a message of equals. Avoid standing over the person. How would you feel if somebody would talk with you like that? It's a little threatening and it's not comfortable, right? It's not respectful. Establish and maintain eye contact with the person. A person with Alzheimer's said, make sure you have my attention. Eye contact helps to get my complete attention. Can the person see your lips? Lip reading is absolutely uh, important as people age and they don't hear as well. Smile, a genuine smile from your heart. A genuine smile from your heart. A genuine smile from your heart. <laughs> know and say the person's preferred name to establish rapport. Introduce yourself. Say, introduce yourself. Say your name and role. Use a clear name tag with large print and good contrast. It saves face. You may need to repeat your name every time you reapproach the person, even if you left the room for a few minutes. Be aware and accommodate for hearing and visual impairments. One resident was deaf in one ear, but she could perfectly, her peer, hear perfectly in the other ear. And louder is not always better. A manager gave a tour to a new employee. He came close to a resident and said, how are you today? What did the resident do? Punched him in the face. <laughs> Be present and listen carefully and closely with all your energy to what the person is saying on two levels. The first level is the words that sometimes may not make sense to you. And the second and most important level is the feelings behind the words. As to the psychological need, as to the psychological need uh, uh, for comfort, many experience avalanches, avalanche of losses and major blows to their self-confidence and self-esteem. As author Jean Lee, as author Jean Lee writes, before my diagnosis, I was living in Shameville. They live in self-doubt and fear of failure. A resident said, sometimes the easiest things are the hardest. Always feel that you are not quite good enough, and sometimes it's very hard. So providing them with frequent adult-to-adult -adult reassurance uh, enables them to be close to others, can alleviate uh, pain and sorrow, calm anxiety, and give them a sense of security. So genuinely say something positive every time you see the person, but be sincere and respectful because many are capable to sense who, is a, a, who can be trusted and who cannot. Never talk about a person in their presence as if they're not there. Uh, this is a case study from the book uh, Learning to Speak Alzheimer's by Quentin Coste. After the doctor spoke about his diagnosis with his wife, as if he wasn't in the room, the person said, damn it all, am I invisible? This is my disease you're talking about. I'm still here, talk to me, me. Use gentle touch, but with those who want and can tolerate it and when it's cultural, culturally appropriate. The person reads you through your touch. Touch speaks louder than words. Hold the person's hand. Put your hand on, on their shoulder. Uh, give a warm handshake with a smile. Give a hug. Many go through most of the days without being touched, without, deprived of human contact. Speak calmly. When you're stressed, they'll sense it, mirror it, and become anxious. 
89% of the communication takes place uh, at the nonverbal level. Uh, they, they sense and will respond to the unspoken, even if you said the right thing. Be aware of your tone of voice. Nomi Fyle suggests using a clear, low, nurturing tone of voice. Avoid sending negative, uh, subtle, subtle negative messages <laughs> or sign, even with a deaf uh, uh, or blind person. Demonstrate first. Um, while holding a cup of coffee and pointing to it, you can ask, would you like a cup of coffee? <clears throat> Use short, simple sentences. Ask only one brief question at a time. Present only one idea at a time. Allow the person enough time to process what you said or find the right words. Prepare to repeat, prepare to repeat what the person said. Provide frequent reminders. Um, never interrupt the person in the middle of the sentence. On the other hand, make sure the person is comfortable interrupting you. If you want, by the time you finish, they may forget what they wanted to say. Avoid using abstract phrases, uh, phrases metaphors, figures of speech, idioms, and slang. They may not understand it and may take it literally. Talk slowly, but don't, do, don't overdo it. A person with Alzheimer's said, let me set the pace of the conversation. Emphasize the key words in your sentence. The last word in your sentence will be remembered the most. Uh, a woman sat with her husband uh, in the dining room, and she said, it's so cold and it's raining so hard outside. So what did he do? He stood up and walked outside without, yeah. without a rain gear. Avoid saying, wait for me here. The person is likely to forget and may leave the area unattended. It, it happened to a, a wife with her husband. She was preparing him for a shower, and she forgot the towels. She said, wait a minute. By the time she left, he left the house, walked into the street naked. Accept and acknowledge all emotional expression and feelings and fears, and such as fears and helplessness. Never argue, reason, correct, or criticize a person. Instead, listen carefully to the underlying meaning of what the person is saying. Another rule we should know, another uh, important principle is that we can, you can never win an argument with a person with Alzheimer's. A nurse, you broke your teeth last week. A resident, I did not, I broke it this morning. Nurse, you broke it when you, were, when you ate popcorn last week. Resident, why do you have to argue with me? Nurse, I don't. Resident, you do, you argue, and you make my life miserable. The following phone conversation took place between a 45-year-old daughter and her 84-old uh, mother with Alzheimer's who thinks she's 50 years old. Um, it's taken from the film Complaints of a Dutiful um, Daughter. Um, I may take a couple more minutes because we started two minutes after, if that's okay. Uh, mo uh, mother, do they give grades now in college? Daughter, well, we're not in college, so we don't have to worry about it. Mother, oh, we don't do anything then anymore? We don't get our college grades? Daughter, no, we don't have to do that anymore. Mother, oh, what do you do? Do you do just passing or what? Daughter, well, we're not in college, so we don't have to worry about grades. So, mother, so it's whatever the university decides that we'll talk about. And the mother added, I guess I don't, I guess I don't, I don't know what else they'll do. Reflecting back on these frustrating conversations, the daughter said, for the longest time, I still insisted on truth, reality being important. She would say, it's April, and when it was May, and I would say, oh, no, 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 it's May. And finally, it dawned on me. You know, I have to be out of my mind. I mean, what does it matter? First of all, I would say it's May, and the next minute, she won't remember it's May anyhow. And secondly, what does it matter if she thinks it's April? If she was really convinced that we were in the sorority together at UC, or, where, or where we were in elementary school together, at a certain point I realized, why not? Why not say, well, I haven't seen any of the AE5 girls lately, as opposed to saying, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't go to UC when you did, because I'm your daughter, and you are that much older than me. It was a liberating moment when I could just say, no, I haven't seen anybody from AE5. Have you? And it was kind of light and fun. And then we were in the moment, and the moment was we were two old friends trying to reminisce. And the content didn't matter. It was the feeling that mattered. 
One woman even said, I'm not Jewish. But the same woman, however, regularly enjoyed participating in Jewish services and holidays. Remember, your goal is to promote positive emotions in the moment. Ask yourself, whose need is it really? Is it really a problem? And as Richard Taylor asked, who is really embarrassed by all that stuff? And as Lori LaBay, founder of Alzheimer's Speaks, um, developed this wonderful wristband, and it says, are they safe, are they happy, and are they pain-free? This helps us to remember what's really important here. So Nomi File says, validate the subjective truth, internal reality, and feelings of the person, no matter how logical, chaotic, or paranoid they may seem to you. You'll want to try to tune into the depth of their reality. So avoid, avoid trying to reorient them to the present day reality and, and when the recent memory, the short term memory, is no longer working. Uh, don't confront the person with errors in objective reality because this usually leads to frustration, anxiety, hostility, and aggression. Gentle orientation is okay, but without provocation. And when the person is wants and able to remain aware of the present time. So stop testing or quizzing the person. What did you have for dinner last night? Or don't you remember you just had that? Don't tell the person with Alzheimer's who is looking for his parent that his parent is dead. A person should mourn the loss of their loved ones once, not 50 times. Ask for their help. Many love to help and want to continue to feel useful. <clears throat> Give the person a choice, but only a limited number. Ask them, would you like the blue yarmulke or the white yarmulke? Keep it to a small number of choices, otherwise you'll overwhelm them. And last, use humor and be playful. A resident in, Alzheimer, in early stages Alzheimer's in my study said, humor is the only prescription that never fails. Laugh from your heart with the person. Do it intentionally. Don't just wait for the magical moments to occur spontaneously. Examples used successfully include therapeutic clowns, comedy activities, laughter yoga, as we saw earlier in, in, in the first picture, and visits to the circus. In summary, we can continue and communicate with the person well into the later stages of the disease and even into the last breath. As a granddaughter of a woman with Alzheimer's in the mid-stages of Alzheimer's said, underneath the shell of memory loss, the confusion, and the sadness, there is a person with a heart that will always remember. Know that, know that the ability to feel remains much later than the ability to speak, remember, and understand. So focus on feelings not on, and less on facts. Re respond to the emotion, not the behavior. It's all about building close trusting relationships and helping the person find meaning and purpose in their lives today, in this very moment. And I would like to close uh, with two quotations. A physician, Dr. Jampolsky, said, perhaps the true healing, perhaps true healing has more to do with listening and unconditional love than with trying to fix people. And Joanne Cohen Coste, the author of the excellent book, Learning to Speak Alzheimer's, writes, it isn't Alzheimer's that takes away the person's dignity. It is other people's reactions that do. Um, so we're going to take a one-minute break so John can uh, uh, switch the video cassette, and then we're going to see a, a video, Nomify interacts with a person in advanced stages of Alzheimer's. It's quite powerful. <laughs> 